Thank you, Patsy, uh, for doing all these technical logistics and welcome everybody to the first uh, More Beautiful World progress report, which originally I was, I the, the first time I did something like this, I called it uh, the State of the World Address. That seemed a little bit too grandiose um, and too pompous. So, uh, and More Beautiful World progress report is uh, more in line with what I'm intending for this, which is to um, kind of take notes and share my notes uh, on our progress, which sometimes doesn't seem like we are making any progress, but our progress toward what I call the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. You know, that title, uh, it was the title of, of one of my books, I chose it very deliberately. The heart knows it's possible, but the mind does not, or does not always know that it's possible where the mind doubts. And in those moments of doubt, we have to, if we're going to continue serving the emergence of that world, we have to trust the heart. And other times the heart and mind will be in alignment. But as we make our way from an old story into the next story, often the things that we need to do, uh, the sense that we need to make conflicts with the inherited programs of the mind. So in those moments, we have to trust the discernment of the heart. And it is the same, that same function of heart discernment, which allows us to see that we actually are making progress because from our received um, perceptual set, from our received ways of seeing the world, it looks very much like things are getting worse and worse, that we are making not progress toward a more beautiful world, but we are actually going the other direction. So my purpose here is to bring in some of the phenomena, some of the events, some of the movements that might be underneath the surface that can be seen from the heart's perspective, uh, hopefully not too much in contradiction with the mind, but can be seen from that perspective and to share those so that uh, all of us can see them together. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm calling the title of this first, this first More Beautiful World Progress Report, um, Hope Begins in the Unknown. But, and I guess I'm using known in a, in a very specific way, uh, mental knowledge, empirical knowledge, Mostly it's inherited knowledge, what we have inherited from uh, the society and the mythology that we grew up in. And when we are, at least, I mean, I've experienced this an awful lot. Uh, when, when I get locked into that set of the known, locked into my, the, the, the legacy knowledge, then I lose hope because again, from that constricted sense of what is possible, there is no hope. And, and I'm probably not the only one here who has gone through periods of despair. So uh, I'd like to bring in um, a couple things, you know, in these, in these uh, broadcasts, um, I'm gonna draw on things that are in the news and also things that are not in the news, either because they're happening just on, in a much smaller sphere uh, or because they are not deemed important enough to be in the news. And this is part of the foray into the unknown, the gathering of, of, of threads uh, from, from the unknown that allows us to weave a fabric of hope, a fabric of possibility that is not delusional. You know, it's simply recognizing that that we have to bring things in from outside of normal. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to uh, talk about, it's uh, rep the report of a dialogue between uh, former president Donald Trump and a, a judge, Judge, uh, uh, what was it, Napolitano, Napolitano, I think it was. And, and in that dialogue, um, Basically, the, the judge was like, hey, you promised that you were going to 
make all of the JFK assassination records public as required by law. And you didn't do it. I'm very disappointed. Why, why didn't you do it? And Trump, if you had seen what they showed me, then you wouldn't have made them public either. And the judge was like, who is they? What do you mean they? And Trump said, I'll tell you another time when we're not on the phone with 15 other people listening. So this is one of the peaks behind the curtain that we get sometimes. Now, I don't know. I mean, I could speculate what was in those documents that is 60 years later, that is so sensitive that Donald Trump thinks that it is unfit for the American public to view. I mean, I could say a lot about, and, you know, not to be partisan here, Joe Biden also has not released the full JFK assassination documents. Okay, so we have basically a bipartisan uh, contempt for democracy and contempt for the people. So 60 years later, what, you know, what could be so sensitive that, that the, the people who are supposed to be the sovereigns in a democracy, the people are not allowed to see it. They're not fit to see it. They're not trusted to see it. What could it be? And I could speculate on it, but I'm not going to do that right now uh, because it's enough because I don't know. Actually, I don't know. I have my theories, but I don't know. Uh, but what we can know for sure is that there is something there. There is a, 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 a layer of reality that is outside of public awareness. And I'm sure that that is not the only bit of reality outside the public awareness. Everybody knows this. What happened in 1963? Um, I'm just going to go into this a little bit was that, you know, the, the official story of the assassination was an obvious lie, obvious. The whole thing, the lone gunman, the magic bullet, you know, that, that went in and out and then hit somebody else, uh, the, um, the, 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 the assassination of the assassin on national TV before he could testify, uh, the, uh, his CIA background, I mean, you can, there's whole books on this. It was an obvious lie. And on some level, nobody believed it. Nobody believed it. But to countenance the lie, to admit to yourself that you didn't believe it, was too much cognitive dissonance for people to handle. And so not everybody, but collectively, the public, decided that they would believe the lie. That opened up the doorway to believe a hundred, a thousand, a million other lies. And it created a, not only a separation between, and, and a breach of trust between the people and their government, but also within ourselves. And it is therefore, you know, 60 years later, it's not, we, we, you know, as, as our consciousness has grown, maybe, you know, you don't even know anything about this historical event, but the general consciousness of we are being lied to, there is something, another reality behind the curtains. I mean, it could be, I think in the last call I mentioned, you, you know, UFO disclosure, things like that, um, that there is, and, but it doesn't have to be like this, you know, conspiratorial esoteric stuff. There's also the level of, of you know, how to be healthy. And 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 like this this pretense that everything is okay when you know chronic disease, which used to afflict maybe five ten percent of the population, now affects more than half half the people. Every family, uh, something like sixty percent of children, if you include childhood obesity and, and diabetes and stuff like that. Like this is not normal. So. We are in a time now, and this is part of the progress toward a more beautiful world. We are in a time where we where we start to look outside of 
what has been narrated to us as reality. So I want to, um, I, 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 a few days ago, I, I uh, uh, um, was at an event with um, a Kennedy event with, uh, and one of the one of the people on the panel with me was was Zen Honeycutt, who shared a really beautiful story that uh, I want to invite her on um, to share the story about her son, and uh, as as you know, more of a positive example of what is when we do look outside of the known. Why I say that that is where hope begins, but it doesn't end there. So, Patsy, if you can uh, find Zen here, hopefully she's on. Hi, Charles. Hi, everyone. Hey, Zen. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. It's an honor. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the story about my son, he was nine years old, my son, Ben, and he had been struggling with food allergies for years. He had actually almost died from pecans and the stuffing on Thanksgiving. So we almost lost him. But uh, at this time, he was nine years old. He had been suffering with allergies, about 20 different allergies for about four years. And he was sitting at the breakfast table with his lips swollen, red, cracked. It looked like his mouth had been sucked on by a vacuum cleaner. And he looked at me forlornly and he said, Mom, I wish all my allergies would go away. And I said, me too, buddy. But in my head, I was thinking that's never going to happen because the doctors had told me that with every exposure, his allergies would get worse and could eventually be life-threatening, especially the nut allergies. And then I realized what the voice in my head was saying. I was aware of it. And I said, wait a second, that's not empowering. I'm committed to being courageous and creative and a contribution in this world. And that voice is a victim voice. It's a, you know, it's seeing my son as small. It's seeing myself as small. What if something else was possible? And then I realized uh, that my cousin Sarah had gone gluten-free for a year and she was able to, after healing her gut, you know, eat a piece of pizza at a birthday party or a piece of wedding cake at a wedding and she was able to be okay. So I reminded my son of this story and said to him, Ben, would you like to someday, like a year from now, be able to eat a slice of pizza at a birthday party? And he looked at me and his eyes got big and he said, yes. And I said, well, then would you do whatever it takes? Like, would you be my partner in your health? Would you drink green drinks and try Chinese herbs and, you know, acupuncture? Would you do whatever it takes to get better? And he thought about it seriously. And he said, yes. And so I shook my, put my hand out and I said, then I promise you, buddy, you will get better. Now at that moment, it was like one of those white light, like, holy crap, what did I just say? You'd like, I did not know how he was going to get better. But I did know that if I made a promise to my son, right, when you make a promise to somebody, you step up, you take actions that you normally would never take. And that promise and that partnership created a new future that we could both envision with him eating a slice of pizza at a birthday party a year from now that we were in alignment with. And we did that. We researched GMOs and glyphosate, learned about the food supply. Within four months, that red line that was <clears throat> you know, around his mouth that usually lasted two weeks only lasted two days. And it was just a faint pink line under his lip when he was exposed to his allergens. And within a year of eating all organic, that was going non-GMO. And then with a year of going all organic, his allergies that were life-threatening at a 19 went down to a 0.2. And so he no longer has a life-threatening allergy anymore. I have peace of mind that is priceless that my son will not die from food. And he has been our organic whole food plant-based diet advocate for, I think, 10 years now and has not been to the doctor during that time once except for, you know, physical checkups for sports. Wow. So... <laughs> new future. And he's, you know, a food advocate and we've created moms across America. We have, you know, reaching millions of people around the world now and people are getting better when they eat organic. And uh, that was not something that I knew was possible, but, you know, absolutely I can see as possible when you get in alignment with that new future. And when you make a promise to somebody and you step up and take actions and you create partnership. And that's what I see you're creating Charles with the, mm -hmm. with your work and with the Kennedy campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Zen. That that's, um, you know, when when you told him, when you made that promise to him, even though you didn't know how to get there, I'm I'm sure that you would not have said it to him if you didn't believe it were possible on some level. 
Oh, I absolutely believed it was possible. Yes, but it, like, but it where was Where did scary. you access that? Where did you access that 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 belief in that moment? Like, how did you know? Because, or how did you recognize? You know what? I had a moment where it was like, I don't care if I have to eat bird seed with my son. Right? I am going to do whatever it takes to get my son better, and I'm going to do that in partnership with him. I realized we needed to do it together. I needed I needed to step up and have some you know commitment to him and and I knew from my cousin Sarah that somebody else you know she had healed her gut a bit she had gotten at least somewhat better right. you know and the ironic thing is of course he didn't want to eat the pizza at the birthday parties after he got better <laughs> <laughs> he knew that that food was crap and he eats only organic whole food plant like he'll go to a restaurant with other people and sit there and just eat nothing like if it's mm -hmm. not organic whole food plant based he won't eat it so um, he has pristine health and is in amazing condition, but I, I just, I just knew that he could get better. And if, if I, if he didn't get as well as I wanted him to, at least he would get more well, at least by yeah. trying, right. We would make progress, mm -hmm. but we would only do that if we made a promise to each other and had partnership, just, eh, I'll try 80, 20, that just wasn't going to cut in anymore. It, we needed a hard line of we are going to do this all in. You, you know, when, when I um, have that, that, those kinds of, uh, of, of vows, you know, those kind those moments of I will do whatever it takes. I've noticed that if I have any um, reservations, if I'm carrying any doubts or reservations, then the universe will basically say to me, uh, are you sure you will do whatever it takes by presenting me with a situation that calls on me to make a sacrifice or calls on me to do something brave in order to actually demonstrate that I was serious when I said that I will do whatever it takes. And I'm wondering if, uh, I know you have to, you have a, a to go soon, but do you have, can you, did you have any moments like that where, where you in, really in had to that be. moment, no, I was crystal clear. And I really appreciate you bringing up that because there have been, I've, I can relate, there have been moments when I haven't been crystal clear about something and uh, things get wishy-washy and the universe doesn't really present what needs, to, you know, what needs to come along. But in that moment, I was so clear that it was time for him to get better. He had suffered for seven months on and off, two weeks at a time, you know, for years before that with all these different allergies and I, I realized that I had been full of resignation and doubt. You know, mm -hmm. I had done this program called Landmark. So I had learned about mm -hmm. you know, breakthroughs and all that stuff. And I had, I saw myself being full of resignation and doubt for those past few years, just putting up with the fact that he had these allergies and was going to be a lifetime of suffering. I mean, this kid was mm -hmm. going to school with this mouth, you know, it was horrible. And I said, no enough is enough. He's going to get better. And I'm going to figure out how to do it with him. And I was extremely clear about that. And that's why I say it was like a white light moment. It was really mm -hmm. something that I, I felt called to do. And, and I think that if we are open and committed to it, we can man like we can create that. It doesn't have to just be like waiting for God to send it to us. You know, mm -hmm. we, we like put right. ourselves on the line. Right. And we can cause that. And that's that's why the first word for our nonprofit is, you know, empower, educate, empower. Mm -hmm. it, well, it was empower. Now it's educate and empower. But that is what I believe needs to happen for us to shift the needle in creating this new world that we want to create. It is we need to be clear about what it is we're creating. We need to promise that we're going to do it, like put our butts on the line in a serious way. And we need to have partnership with other we need community Mm -hmm. And so that's why I love you're creating this community with people because I, I get that sense from them when I'm in them with them in person at your, you know, your NAS group in Asheville. I get the sense from of commitment and dedication from people that is uh, very rare to find and it should be more prevalent for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Zen. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. I'm going to um, uh, unpack some elements of that story, although you've already um, said a lot of what I would say. <laughs> thank you. Um, but, you know, one of them, so, okay, maybe just uh, to pick up on what I was saying before about, about the, you know, internal reservations and doubts um, that prevent that full commitment to something that we say we want. 
sometimes, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to like treat those reservations and doubts as necessarily an enemy. Sometimes they can signal that what we say we want isn't actually the highest or best thing that we could be committing our life energy to. So if that's the case, then maybe there's some internal work to do to become clear on what you want. On that panel, it was interesting, actually, another guy on the panel that Zen and I were on was a uh, UFC fighter, a mis mix mixed martial arts fighter. This guy is, <laughs> he, I would say he's a really scary dude, except that he has like, he is so friendly um, uh, and has such a big smile that like, I mean, he's just like this incredibly huge and muscular teddy bear, you know? So I'd say he's a scary dude, but he, but he was asked a question about courage. The, the um, topic of courage came up. And um, when it was my turn, I also said some things about courage. You know, I said that it comes from clarity. It comes from uh, being unconflicted. Because when you're unconflicted and you know what you value, you know what's what's important, you know what you want, then you're not going to be going different directions at the same time. As I said, fear, doubt, reservation, these can be signals, not enemies, signals that you are not fully clear. <laughs> when you're clear as a creative being, you are unstoppable. You are at least, let's say, a mighty force. And when many people are clear and aligned, then it is an even mightier force. And so, one of the things that we can do to, I mean, to, to return it to the, my first theme, you know, of democracy, one, you know, this is what democracy is. It is to collectively become clear on something that, that forges the people into an unstoppable force. Democracy is not something that gets uh, allotted to us from the outside. It's not something that we can beg the authorities to grant us and hope that and, and appeal to them to relent in their their nefarious projects and their censorship, you know, and their corruption and their their uh, manipulation of the system for their own profit. Please stop doing that. No, that's not going to do it. We have to. It, it is to to forge an agreement field and act upon that in clarity and coherency. That's what democracy is. It's, it's, a, it's a positive movement. You know, and, and, and Zen got the agreement. This was crucial. It got the agreement of her son, Ben. And she knew to get that agreement before she went in as a rescuer to try to uh, compensate for maybe his lack of commitment. So this is a kind of a preparatory stage. Why have we not been able to restore democracy or preserve democracy in this country? I think the preparatory stage of clarifying our desire, of, of, of generating an agreement field, like there's a lot in the way of that. A lot of these doubts and reservations and conflicts. Um, and I'm not saying we have to, you know, completely get clear before we even begin something, because it's more of a process. You know, you you think you know what you want, you 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 try to achieve it, you find that that you're getting in your own way, and that maybe sends you into an introspective process, and then you have a bit more clarity. You know, it's not always like a light going off, like Zen described. Often it is a more of a process. And it happens in a group too. <clears throat> so this is another aspect I wanted to bring up. Uh, the she had to know on some level that what she had promised to her son is possible. How do you know something is possible that you have never seen? It's very hard when when your entire reality has been in one enclosure to know that there is anything outside of that enclosure. And that's why it is so important for us to share with each other. And this is one of the, one of the main functions that I want to establish on this platform. I, I didn't mention that, that these more beautiful world reports are embedded in uh, 
I'm calling it the turning of the age. And now again, I'm like, mm, that does sound a bit grandiose, but it's uh, you know, an online community with forums and and we'll have a discussion, people, you know, off discussion rooms after this and and Q and A. And um, we have, you know, incubator for projects and all that kind of stuff. But one of the main reasons that one of the main intentions of this um is to help each other know that there is something beyond possibilities beyond what we have been able to see ourselves because we have all been cast into the story the society the matrix of separation the story of the separate self the story of of self versus other the story of an objective reality separate from ourselves the story of human separate from nature all all of these deep mythologies uh, we we've been born into all of these deep mythologies and that makes like even the fact that that um to many ben's recovery ben's healing seems miraculous seems medically impossible that's what all the doctors said that is an indication that as a society we have accepted as reality itself that which is actually just a story actually just a belief system and and you know we can't like this contempt for people who are not awake who don't see that is misplaced our seeing of something beyond what has been narrated to us as real comes as a gift it comes as a vision it comes as a glimpse it comes in zen's story from hearing you know her cousin um going gluten free and now she's not allergic anymore so that was a glimpse from outside the matrix outside the matrix of you know the doctors saying it's impossible i mean i admire zen for trusting that glimpse cuz i know that i have gotten many glimpses and ignored them you know and basically on some level pretended to myself that that isn't real that didn't happen that doesn't count i need more proof i don't believe it and you know stayed in a smaller reality a smaller possibility um and therefore foreclosed the 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 possibility of committing to something that i know is real to even know what we want we have to see the menu we have to see the menu to choose the dish and the menu that we are given conventionally is very narrow limited menu you know i i mentioned at the beginning the uh incredible levels of chronic disease in this country that afflict every family that make this um smaller reality and this limited possibility more and more uncomfortable that's the the push that discomfort that in in it makes it becomes intolerable and it and it pushes us out of the uh, of of the womb of the enclosure of these of the old story and then there's also the pull which is those glimpses that we get what we see outside of it the stories that we hear when we do have that commitment when we do have that clarity that zen exemplifies that we can then carry it to others and and first say yeah i've seen that too and here's my living example of what is possible when i step into that space when i make that commitment and then also to so first to say it it, it exists here's another menu item and then also to accompany each other on the journey of commitment to that possibility because you know that was a that was a key part like i will do whatever it takes is what sen said i will do whatever it takes and those are not just words in the head that corresponds to i would even say a physiological change it is a an act of self transformation it says i will become 
the person who will do whatever it takes. And that change in the self is what actually, it, you know, so contrary to the Cartesian story of an objective reality, uh, self and other, inner and outer, all of us know that they are intimately connected. So when you have such a profound change in yourself, you also change the world. And things that were impossible become possible. And this gets very paradoxical. Things that were objectively truly impossible now become possible. Why? Because you are in a different reality. You have shape-shifted into a different, into a different cosmos almost. And how did you do that? You let go of who you had been and step into something else. So this is, uh, you know, I could link this to the, the global level too. Like, what about the possibility of peace? Are we ready for that? Are we ready to say, I will do whatever it takes? To be ready to do that, you have to know that it's possible. You have to see that it's possible. And what we are seeing now in the news tells us the opposite. It is, you know, the best case scenario is, you know, like say in Gaza, you know, well, it's a temporary ceasefire, you know, and, and the possibility that I sense of, of, you know, of a uh, joint stewardship of the three Abrahamic religions over the Holy Land in peace and love and mutual respect, mutual admiration even. That, to even say that sounds so naive. But I invoke it nonetheless because I know that it is possible. And when you know something's possible, then you can commit to it. And, and when something isn't possible, that can be signaled through reservations and doubts and fear. That might be telling you, you know, that your ambition to, you know, become president of the world or your ambition to, uh, you know, establish a base on Mars or something like that, maybe that is not actually possible. Maybe that, that vision is just a projection field of some kind of um, internal story, some kind of grandiosity, um, some desire to um, for respect, for love, who knows? There could be all kinds of psychology going there. And then the other thing I wanna draw out of Zen's story is that moment where she said, enough, that kind of preceded her commitment, enough. Enough. And I'm sure that many of you, as I do, look at the world, look at all that's happening, and we say, enough. Enough of the division. Enough of the pollution. Enough of the, the destruction of rainforests. Enough of the slaughter. Enough. Enough of the squandering of our of our energy and resources and attention, enough. The no precedes the yes. And it opens up the possibility of seeing what to say yes to. And so to bring it back to chronic disease, you know, this uh, the grievous, grievous condition of our country. Um, and I say our country I know a lot of people on this call are not in the United States, not in North America. Um, we're kind of the epicenter here of the illness, of the global illness. Our chronic disease, you know, here I'm going to get, allow my national pride to swell. Uh, you know, we are number one, number one in the whole world in chronic disease. Number one in, well, maybe, I don't know if that's strictly true, but pretty close in, in concentration of wealth. Maybe not number one, but many, in, 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 many, in many ways, uh, 
my country is the epicenter of a global illness. And so we have, you know, a majority of the population chronically ill. And why is that? I could talk about all the all the the factors that that Zen's organization works with. You know, the pollution of our soil, of our air, of our water, the degradation of the food supply, electromagnetic radiation, uh, uh, pharmaceutical drugs injected and fed to people, you know, throughout their entire lives. Um, there's many, you know, uh, trauma, uh, 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 despair, loss of meaning, addiction, you know, there's so much on that level. On a deeper level, the chronic disease epidemic is caused by neglect. Neglect of ourselves, neglect of each other, and the turning of our attention toward conquest, toward domination, toward expansion, toward toward to return it to, to desire, toward things that we think we want, but that we actually do not want. Things that are substitutes for what we really want. The kind of wealth that America, my country, the United States, has led the world in the pursuit of that kind of wealth, which doesn't meet the real needs of a human being. That is the origin of, or part of the neglect that I'm talking about. And so now, after years, after decades of neglect, we are crying for attention. We are not okay. And it is becoming harder and harder to pretend that we are okay. So the chronic disease epidemic is of the same origin as the poverty epidemic, as the homelessness crisis, um, as the immigration crisis even. You know, like why are so many people so desperate to leave their homes and come here? My, my wife Stella was, was drawing an analogy yesterday about, about how um, when a body is in, in terminal decline, uh, it's, 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 it will, you know, take the, the toxicity and, and shunt it from one place to another to another. Like the heart can't deal with it right now. You know, I'm going to shunt it to the liver. The liver can't deal with it right now. Uh, the body's just getting overwhelmed. And our collective body seems kind of like that too. You know, there's the migrants come where, oh, yeah. And, and, and my sister-in-law was telling the story also about how, you know, she works in a, in a hospital setting, social worker. And like they're sending all these homeless people to their unit, you know, and they can't handle all these homeless people. Like this. So they rebel, you know, they talk to management. We cannot handle, we cannot do our jobs anymore. So they get all sent then, okay, then they get sent to the nurses, you know, to some other unit. And they can't handle it either. So they rebel and then they get sent somewhere else and somewhere else. They're getting shunted around uh, and cannot be ignored anymore. And so this is, this is, you know, also the result of neglect. What if we neglected in the pursuit of what we don't even actually want and need? That pursuit kind of made sense as long as it wasn't, as long as the misery levels were not so high. But now the misery levels are rising. And we reached that point of enough. We cannot do this anymore. It's still hideable for a lot of people. You know, you go out, you see people driving in their cars. It's not obvious the amount of suffering behind those windows. You drive through a neighborhood, it's not obvious the amount of suffering in, the, in those houses behind those doors. Walk through the airport or train station, shopping mall. It's not obvious the amount of suffering behind those faces. All these brave people doing their best. Heroic. Each one of those people is life. Powerful. Resilient. But when you start to look with those eyes, 
the eyes of what is in that realm of the unknown, what is in the realm of what we do not see, you start to see it. You start to see the suffering. You start to notice people walking in a, in a way that, oh yeah, that person has is a debilitating back pain. You know, you, you start to, someone's rude to you in, 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 in the checkout line. You're like, oh, you start to see, oh, you know, that, who knows, their teenager is, is cutting themselves. You know, there's some pain there. And that, the more that we are able to see that, and it's the same heart function that I spoke of at the beginning, that also allows us to see the beauty and the possibility it, it's the same one that, is, that allows us to see the suffering. They all come together, the no and the yes. And so we begin to see these things and it stirs our compassion and the compassion that stirs in anger. You can hear it in enough. Anger, like fear, is not a bad emotion. It enforces a boundary, it, it expels, it says no, enough. Part of the initiatory moment, one of my favorite sayings, um, I don't know if I coined it or if I got it from somewhere. I'm sure other people have said it before. The illness seeks the medicine. And also the medicine seeks the illness. So here we are at the epicenter of a global illness in my country with historically maybe unprecedented levels of chronic disease, of sickness. I don't know if it compares to the Black Death, but the amount of suffering is staggering. Here we are. So what is the medicine that it is bringing? Well, if the origin of the illness is neglect, then the medicine that it is bringing is compassion. And on a more mundane level, more practical level, it's also bringing incredible healing technologies. And, and understanding modalities that can accomplish the impossible. When we trust the perception of that the impossible is possible, when we have been clued in by those stories, gluten-free for a year, look what happened. When we get clued in by the stories that we share on our platform and commit to it, then they become possible. And that anger then has somewhere to go, somewhere constructive. So neglect, the illness, brings compassion, the medicine. Which is ironic, you know, that <laughs> that, that might be the future of American leadership. Healing. Not the kind of leadership that is imposed by force, kind of the, the reverse of what this country's conception of itself has been, the hero nation imposing order on the world. No, this comes from the humiliation of, of that, that, that is born from our current condition. So I'm just gonna pause for a moment here See if there's any other threads I want to pick up and then maybe bring it bring it back home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of pieces here. Starting with the the anguish, the compassion, um, the child with the swollen lips, the and the things that we're seeing in the world. And the, the moment of enough, enough. And then the commitment, I will do whatever it takes. And the establishing of an agreement. And then the search guided by the intuition of a possibility. All of those things. And so I would invite you now to take in all of these, um, all of these elements, and feel into 
And also the other thing I mentioned too, the, the you know, maybe there's doubts, maybe there's reservations. That would be a preceding stage where, where Zen said, you know, something in her mind said, oh, but it's impossible. You know, the boy said, I wish I didn't have any allergies. I wish so too, buddy. But thinking it's impossible, like there's that, that's also part of it. And so I want, I, I invite you all now to sense the presence of each of these, each of these stages as if they were alive in you. And which one is the most present? Which one is the stage that you're at now? And you're probably at all of them, as am I. Excuse me a second, I'm just gonna switch my environment momentarily. Okay, returning to you all. I'm just gonna switch gears here because, you know, I was feeling actually some trouble in myself. I thought, yeah, you know, I want to give space and welcome to that too. Because even though the story that Zen told us was rather heroic, like a light bulb going off, crystal clear, we're not always in that place. And striving to emulate that heroism will not take us there. The process is much more gentle than that. So trust the effect of that story and all of my interpretation of it and all that has been said, trust that. that it lands in you and works on you and delivers its medicine because it was a medicine story that we heard. And, un and, and, and know in this moment that the power of that story will be all the greater from a place of completely accepting where you are right now. even if it is a place where, where you have doubts, confusion, fear, despair. And in this moment, with your eyes closed, Hold all of those things along with the story and the upliftment, all the positive and negative that you may be feeling in this big container of serenity. And in this quiet, you can sense what I call the more beautiful world 
our hearts to know is possible. That it's real. And you feel your trust in all that has pointed you towards it. This story and many others that have pointed you towards it, you feel trust in those pointers. And you understand that your steps will take you towards there, that you will recognize what those steps are. And in this peaceful and serene confidence, open your eyes. And I guess you're probably listening or looking at a screen with me on it. And I now will thank you. Before I turn you over to Patsy, I will thank you for um, your time and attention and spending this 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 um, this hour of your day. Um, and I really look forward to continuing this journey and supporting and and developing this community of mutual support um, and and exercising the group function and the agreement field of the clarity and commitment that we've talked about today.